Hello everyone, I'm Blair Lee and thank you for coming to this talk today, How to Take Your Science from Ho-Hum to Wow. I'm standing in my kitchen today because this is where wow science happens for a lot of home educators. Wow science happens out here too. There's a bird's nest in that tree. Now, that's not to say that wow science is all nature studies and doing fun labs and activities. In order to have wow science, kids really need to learn science. And that requires a certain amount of reading, usually, sometimes good videos. Now, wow science can seem pretty easy if all you're doing is labs and nature studies. Those are really fun. But in order to act, but your kids aren't really learning science that way. Science, let me define science so you'll know what I mean. Science is the discipline, academic discipline, where you learn how the natural and physical world actually works. And in order to understand how the natural and physical world actually works, you have to use your head and learn the theory, usually through reading a lesson, and then use your hands as you directly apply with the direct hands-on application of what you've learned through the theory. And that's how learning science really happens, so that your children have an understanding of the principles that demonstrate what they're seeing. In other words, if your kids have learned about chloroplast, for instance, and you decide to put together a microscope slide, and they and they've learned about cells, and they look at a slice of a leaf, they know what they're really looking at. They can see stomata, which is how the um, carbon dioxide comes in and oxygen goes out. They see the chloroplast that absorbs sunlight. It's really exciting. They really understand what they're seeing instead of, wow, I didn't know there were particles this little in a leaf. I guess that's why they're green. So quite a big difference in understanding there and in the actual learning of science. So remember, when you're thinking about not just science, but definitely science, almost all academic disciplines, there's the head and the hands together. That's what really makes science wow. However, it's also what makes science challenging for a lot of people, and I know people get nervous. Well, I decided to tackle that challenge head on today, and I chose, I'm going to do a demonstration from one of my labs. I'm actually going to do one of my labs, and I, the topic I chose, despite writing a lot of different chemists, a lot of different science courses, I chose chemistry. <laughs> because if there's any science that makes people nervous about teaching, it's chemistry. But first, I'd like to introduce myself, a little bit about me. I'm a scientist and a curriculum developer for Pandaya Press's critically acclaimed Real Science Odyssey series. Pandaya Press is a publisher that publishes science, primarily publishes science and history. I have degrees in chemistry and biology, bachelors, and a master's in chemistry, all from the University of California at San Diego. In addition, I've taught biology and chemistry at, college, at the college level, and I've successfully homeschooled my son all the way through. He graduated and now he's at college. When teaching, one of the things that I observed is that my students, my college level students, didn't understand basic science. And I felt really bad about that, especially in chemistry where students don't take chemistry as an elective. Students in chemistry, they want to be nurses or vets or doctors. And if they can't pass chemistry, those careers are closed to them. So I started thinking about why that was. I really put a lot of thought into it. And what I decided was that we are failing students, not at the college level. Science is taught pretty well in college. Where we're really failing students is K through 12. So I started thinking about, I started rethinking, reimagining what science education would look like. And of course, as you can guess, it involves the head and the hands. Now you might think with all this talk about college that I'm only looking at how science should be taught to kids who are college bound. And that's not the case. I think we can all agree, given the situation in the world right now, that all of us need some sort of science literacy. 
even if your avenue is a vocational field or if you have no aspirations for ever going to college, there's a certain amount of science literacy that is needed. And you get that by doing science, by learning some of the basic science information and then by putting those into practice. So I gave some thought about how science reimagined how science should be thought in grades K through 12. And then I began using some of those innovations with my son, friends of my son in co-ops that I taught in. And we're about to start teaching some online classes so in science and about how I would use those innovations and those new ideas about how science should be taught in those. Before I get to the demonstration, I want to be clear about what I mean by the hands and the head. The head part are the facts, theories, models, all that come in a small piece that explain a phenomena in the natural and physical world. Often kids learn about this by reading. And then the hands part is the active part where there is an application of that theory directly. So it's not just something that's tacked on. It's something that actually leads to greater understanding of that theory. And to be really honest, that's why I recommend that people use curriculum that's written by actual science educators and scientists. That part can be really hard. I know that you can make science fun and wow without having that connection, but learning science requires that connection. And when you learn science in this way, with the head and the hands, it leads to ownership. This is a concept that people talk about in education, and ownership is where you just know things. If I were to say something to you like, three times three is six, you would argue with me forever. You would never agree with that, because you have ownership over the fact that three times three is nine. That's what ownership is about, and you can create ownership for kids in science by thoughtfully pairing the hands and the head component. So that, now the fun active hands part, that can include binoculars, that can include a microscope, that can include fossils, that can include creating models of the, an animal cell like this one. All of these lead to, are an important part of wow science and when before you use these or make these models, you include the head part, the theory, facts, and models part, models that other people have built. That's a really exciting connection that can lead to real science learning. Now, I'm about to do a demonstration for you. There's a PDF that's available to you that shows you the scientific model that I'm going to do today. And I'm gonna actually show you three different models one that scaffolds to the next so you can see how what I mean when I talk about really learning science that's wow. So let's get started. I'm going to take you through a lesson from the course I wrote for Pandaya Press called Real Science Odyssey Chemistry Level 1. Because the best way to learn about something is to do it. I'm not going to read the lesson to you. Instead, I will show you. Before creating a scientific model, I want to define what this term means. A scientific model is a simplified version of a phenomenon from the natural or physical world that helps describe or predict something. You can see in this slide that these three students have all created models that help them understand scientific phenomena. The three models for today were chosen to demonstrate the link between scaffolding, wow science, and real science understanding. Remember, scaffolding is a strategy used to provide guidance and support to help learners achieve new skill levels, moving them to greater independence, and it'll even create mastery and ownership over skills. I'll be the first to admit, science can seem like a lot of work and a bit overwhelming. You may feel you don't know enough to successfully introduce real science that uses scientific theory, vocabulary, and the scientific method in a way that will engage your child and be memorable. When you pair theory with a direct application of hands-on labs, your child will study science much like a scientist does by building models and testing hypotheses. 
you're watching me create a two-dimensional model of a helium atom. Helium was thoughtfully chosen for this model because of the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons that make it. Now, I know some of you are thinking, hey, that's just a coloring page. And you know what? Out of context, with just this page, without a scientific explanation beforehand of what's on the page, you're correct. It is. As a part of a lesson, however, like you'll find in the downloadable PDF that accompanies this talk, it's a simple two-dimensional model of an atom and the parts that make it. This simple two-dimensional model is an essential first step to understanding molecules and how they form and reform in a chemical reaction, and even understanding the periodic table and matter. In fact, all wow, and honestly, even ho-hum science is based on atoms, molecules, and matter. This model is a good example of the connection between the head and hands for real learning. Students could just read the lesson or have it read to them and look at this drawing, the head part. But unless your child has a photographic memory, and maybe not even then, they will not learn and remember the parts of an atom, and they won't understand how these parts are used to determine the placement of elements on a periodic table or how atoms form molecules. This isn't just a coloring activity either. There's a read aloud section that accompanies this page. It's expected that you will read about this model as your child colors it. This pairing of reading about the model as kids create it is a powerful learning technique. You might be thinking this technique is specific to this lesson, but it isn't. You can easily use this learning technique for almost any subject area. In fact, if you think about it, you've probably used it many times while your children were learning math. When you say numbers out loud with your child as they're learning to count, for example, this is the technique you're using. You can also use this for history or a different science topic. For example, if your child is fascinated with spiders, you could find a coloring page of a jumping spider to go along with the wonderful children's book, Nefertiti the Spider Knot. Then, find a description online of the anatomy of a jumping spider and read the description out loud while your child colors the page. In this way, your child will create a scientific model of a jumping spider in general and possibly even Nefertiti. This next model is a three-dimensional model showing the numbers of protons, neutrons, and electrons for the first ten elements in the periodic table. This model is a great example of scaffolded learning as it builds on information from the previous section, the one where kids made the two-dimensional model by coloring a helium atom. By watching this, you'll see me build my way, starting with hydrogen, all the way to the tenth element, neon. Like any good scientific model, this one is a simplified version. I won't go into the details about what those simplifications are. What I want to point out is what this model is focusing on. It is an initial introduction to the names of the first 10 types of atoms. Types of atoms are called elements. It is a hands-on application of the lesson that adding one proton to the nucleus changes the element. For example, there's one proton in the nucleus of hydrogen, two protons in the nucleus of helium, and three for lithium. It is also a hands-on look at the equal pairing of the number of protons and electrons in a neutral atom of an element. The text and this modeling activity bridge the gap between atoms to elements in a way that is fun and engaging for learners. It builds on the concept from the two-dimensional model of a helium atom in a natural progression. It is a great model for scaffolding the next section that teaches about the periodic table, one of the most important scientific models in all of chemistry. In case you're wondering, kids love making this model with the first 10 elements. In fact, I hear from parents all the time how much their kids got out of and into doing this modeling activity. Sticking with the example of Nefertiti the jumping spider, if you wanted to scaffold from a two-dimensional lesson about jumping spiders to more of a three-dimensional approach, you could add a nature hike looking for spiders. You could find dead spiders, possibly in your windowsill, those you could look at with a microscope or magnifying glass. You could even build a three-dimensional model of a spider using clay and other materials to show their segmented legs. Or you could use one of the Lego kits that have pieces that make segmented jointed legs 
Oh, those pieces are really cool. Pair these with good videos and more reading so that your students learn the real science that explains the projects they're making and their observations. This is the third model I'm showing you today. You won't be watching me make this one. In fact, you're looking at a model of the periodic table made by my son when he was eight. This was made about 13 years ago. In fact, it's the prototype for the one that students create in the book. Theirs is more fancy. <laughs> As you can see from looking at this um, poster board, there are several models from the book on it. This compilation is a wonderful example of what can be achieved using a scaffolded approach where simple models build on each other in complexity until students are able to recreate a model as profound as the top two rows of the periodic table. Now my son is about to take his first college chemistry class this summer and when he saw this model for the first time in many years he said to me, wow, I sure knew a lot of chemistry when I was eight years old. Today we've looked at some actionable ways to take science from ho-hum to wow. You're going to want to make sure the science materials you use pair theory with meaningful hands-on labs and activities. Using a scaffolded approach leads to thoughtful guidance and support for your learners so that they will achieve levels of mastery that will wow them and you. Scientific models are an essential component to science learning. Make sure you choose materials that incorporate two-dimensional, three-dimensional, all sorts of meaningful scientific models. Make sure the models and materials you use connect to learning and build incrementally upon each other in a way that makes sense and is manageable for learners. If you do all of these things, one day your 20-year-old might just look at you and say, wow, I sure learned a lot of science when I was eight years old. I want to thank you so much for attending this talk and for taking the time to figure out how to make your child's science learning more wow. We've added the entire unit for both the parts and the types of atoms to the download section of my speaker page and to the Pandaya Press Homeschool Connect Expo booth. While you're there, be sure to check out everything Pandaya Press has to offer. Not only do they have a full selection of science courses for elementary through high school, but they also have history study guides that pull from multiple resources to offer your child a well-rounded view of history. They're also the publishers of the new History Quest Early Times, a read-aloud book that presents history in an engaging and memorable history as a story format. I want to thank you so much for being here today. If you ever have any science questions or comments, or you need some inspiration to make your science more wow, do not hesitate to contact me through pandiapress.com.